Hi all, welcome to another in a 10 minute nutshell game recap. So let's have a look at Mikhail Tal against Botvinnik, game one of the classic 1960 match. So revisiting this, e4 for Mikhail Tal, Botvinnik played a French defence. It went into the winner variation and with the winner black is giving up voluntarily the bishop pair to inflict structural damage. Queen c7 is a very clever move, not just hitting c3 but we see that it also means in this position now f5 is possible guarding that g7 pawn. Queen drops back and she protecting c3 indirectly on a capture. We have knight e7 and now Queen takes g7. Yeah, White's using a bit of time here to gain this material. After c takes d4, it's very dangerous. But a novel move was played in this position, which has become very standard now, which is to play the surprising move. Can you guess? What would you play in this position if I give you five seconds? Okay, King d1. Yeah, it takes the sting out of Queen takes c3. Black played bishop d7, trying to exploit the king on d1 with this diagonal, as we'll see soon. Check. And now knight e2. We see now black's point is d3, trying to rip open this diagonal. So it seems very scary. That's taken. Check. King e1. And black takes a centre pawn. Very complicated position. But now bishop g5 cuts across black's castling rights for the queen side. For the moment, knight c6, d4. The problem is with white's position, the rooks, how are they ever going to get connected? There's congestion here. Very clever, resourceful play now. h4, the rook is given h3 to swing across as needed. That could be useful, for example, for e6, as well as defending c3. e5. Now, here, rook h3 is played. So, with rook e3 coming. Potentially queen f7. D takes. We see knight c takes e5 and now rook e3. So yes, with this rook activated in that pin, f4 is now threatened. King d7. And now the other rook joins the party with rook b1. Hitting b7 immediately. b6. Knight f4. Pressure is being put onto black's position. Rook a e8. And now rook b4 hitting the bishop and maybe rook d4 to follow. Bishop c6, but instead of using rook d4, we see instead queen d1 with c4 now threatened. Knight takes f4. Rook takes f4, keeping the block on the g file and the bishop cutting across here. Knight g6 hitting the rook. The rook moves to d4, keeping that nice blockade. So things like c4 are very dangerous. Rook takes e3. F takes e3, keeping a good grip on the f4 square. You'll note black's pieces are kind of hemmed in here, like that bishop. King c7. c4, yeah, trying to open up things for the two bishops. Bishop takes c4. Queen g7. This looks like why did black want to lose the exchange here? And it is pretty dire. White just takes that and h5 and the game ended here. White's just the exchange up. Why Why did black want to play d takes c4? Let's have a quick check at this position because that seems to just lose immediately. If we have a move like knight e5, c takes is just losing a valuable center pawn and it's just very horrible. And also if d takes, well as, as, as sorry, as, as seen, bishop takes is winning the exchange. But yeah, you know, what what else? King b7, c takes. It's just very, very horrible. Black's getting pushed back. And yeah, it's just a very, very strong position for white here. Things like bishop g2 to follow. There's no problems for white. So yeah, a very, very interesting game uh, where black was under huge pressure here and is crumbling in any case. So that was game one, how it kicked off game one. Very interesting, fascinating use of the rooks in this game by Mikhail Tal.
comments, questions, likes, appreciated. Thanks very much.